Welcome back to Community of Poets. I'm Anthony Sobak, and I'm here today with Maggie Golston, who is a local poet, singer, songwriter, former bookstore owner, Pima West campus faculty member in English and Humanities. Her poetry publications include Spork, Core Press, Printer's Devils, sorry, Printer's Devil Review, and Plowshares. She was the founding arts editor of the Tucson Sentinel. She has an MFA from the University of Arizona. She was a National Poetry Series finalist and is a two-time Pushcart Prize nominee. Welcome, Maggie Golston. Thank you, Anthony. So I wanted to start today with uh, some questions from my online poetry students who uh, <laughs> have submitted a series of questions for our poets today. Um, and the first one is, uh, is generative. Like, what inspires you as a poet? Where do you look for your inspiration? Well, I don't really look any one place in particular, and I think it's really important to sort of democratize the content that goes in. I think that that's a response to the world we live in. And so, whereas Ezra Pound would sit down and read histories of archdukes of wherever, maybe I'm watching RuPaul's Drag Race with a yellow pad um, in my hand. Maybe I'm listening to records that inspire me. Maybe I go to um, a powwow. Um, you know, wherever it is that, that I am, I think it's important to remember that I'm a poet all the time. And the advice that I give my students and that was given to me was, if you are a practicing writer, you never don't have a pencil. Mm -hmm. And what's really cool is since I was a student, because of smartphones, we all have an ability to take notes in our hands at all times. So I think we really want to be sort of porous to the world. And that can be tough because if you're being porous to the world and you turn on CNN, that can feel like poison going in you. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I think it's important so to... One quick follow-up yeah. question. So how does that jive with Emerson's The Poet Needs to Stand In for, for the, the complete person as if we were... I feel like what you're saying is we're not incomplete people, but you know, we, we all have those experiences that are worthy of poetry, right? Absolutely, and also, I think that Emerson's notion of a complete person is sort of undermined by everything we know since. Um, the idea that of a romanticized poet self who is somehow elevated or whose inspiration is completely intrinsic um, has come to feel a little bit exclusive. Mm -hmm. And um, it's no accident, I would think, that Emerson was a man of, a white man of means. Um, the more popular culture is sort of denigrated by poets, the further poets run from a world that's alive and toward a world that's not alive. Now, that's not to say, oh, don't read poetry. Who wants to read poetry? No, everyone should read Emerson, in particular the essay Circles mm -hmm. for Poets is a wonderful resource. Everyone should read um, absolutely omnivorously um, in multiple genres, and specifically looking toward Poets, not just American and English poets, but poets in translation has been really key for me developing as a poet. Excellent. Do you think maybe you could read one for us and tell us what, what you were, where you were inspired, whether that was RuPaul or Emerson? Or... <laughs> well, it's funny you should, uh, this is a good one. Um, I take assignments, poem assignments, really seriously. And I still do some of the poetry assignments that teachers gave me over the years as an undergraduate, in graduate school, and beyond in fellowships. Um, this poem came from an assignment that I really resented initially, which was to go to the zoo and write a poem about the zoo. This person obviously liked Rilke and, and Blake and wanted that kind of a mm -hmm. poem. So I went to the zoo and I was really kind of miserable at the zoo. It was still summer and I was in Salt Lake City and. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anybody, so I was walking alone at the zoo, which is intense. And what I came out with was partly inspired by the zoo, but it was also inspired by the fact that I was watching one of my favorite movies, Pulp Fiction, for about the 12th time. 
Mm -hmm. um, this is a poem called Muted Inverted. The movie begins, lions roar, the dream end of a world. What is closer to us, penned swan, caged beauty, prescription. What is not natural in an age like this? What is long dead, twice removed? Cygnus, olor, mute swan, curve of a neck meant to indicate fermata, class, a turning out of a degree dangerous and redolent with cruelty, the way anything we love can be cruel, in the distance imprints its bell, the hollows beneath a face's flushed contentment, what we love, lightness, admire encasement, bird, not feathers, gods are birds, understand that goodness often hides behind a man's most brutal act, a lie inside a lie, the movie girl, what pleases to the eye and hand so different, barest tragedy phrased only here in nights of clarity and violence, boxing husband, perfect teeth, his going down. In this scene, underneath the lover's banter is the floor of the cage, shit, feathers, bullets, remnants at the edge of the edit, the end of the dream which goes forgotten, ugliness, what is wretched is closed to metaphor, this clumsy swan and gone, sure beauty, knowledge of its virtue undone. Thank you. Of course. I, um, this sort of goes with another, po another question, sort of tying it in and, and adding a spin here. So, uh, you know, you go to the zoo, you, you know, you take it in. Um, presumably, you revised at some point. Yeah. So mm -hmm. my, <laughs> my student wants to know, how do you know when you're finished? How do you know when you've got it? How do you know that the poem has all of the parts that the poem needs, that it has that beauty, that it has that juxtaposition, that it has that turn? Um, and I, I obviously threw some words in there that you can feel free to edit out. But Well, I have some bad news for your students. Mm -hmm. And that is that there's no one way to know when anything's ever done. Uh, as long as we're going back to the American Romantics, Walt Whitman revised one of the greatest poetry books of all time, Song of Myself, something like 30 years after he first published it. So um, we have this tradition um, in poetry and specifically in American poetry of the idea that something is always in progress. So Marianne Moore, modernist poet, um, famously said it's a draft until you're dead and she also republished. And then on the other hand, we have this sort of um, beatnik, Jack Kerouac, just spit it out kind of a mentality um, and famously, New York school poet Frank O'Hara, when asked when a poem was done, he would say, when the telephone rings. As in, I sit for a duration. I, I give it my best unencumbered, unedited self, and then it goes right. away from me. So there's no real way to know. And I think that in a way that can be really daunting for students. My poetry students are often concerned, more often, that they think it's done and that I'm telling them to revise it for a portfolio mm -hmm. at the end of the semester. And You know, I, I, I just have this terrible news for them, which is that you can always go back. And w what I advise people to do is to go back with a job. What do I mean by that? Well, if you look at a poem that feels done, that looks done, if you look at this page, it's in perfect rhyming couplets, oh, well, it's clearly done, right? But maybe it's not. And so I would go in with a job to do. For example, I'm only going to look at modifiers. I'm going to look at my adjectives and my adverbs and make sure that they really need to be there. Or I'm going to only look at the enjammed line breaks and make sure I'm breaking the line at the strongest point. If you have a specific job, then you can revise any number of times mm -hmm. with that mission in mind and then you can complete that mission yeah. so that you do feel like you got from A to B. I like look at the real estate of the poem because everything is very valuable. <laughs> Absolutely. That, to make sure that it's be being used that. Do you think maybe you could read us another poem and, and perhaps talk a bit about 
how you went back to it at a certain point? Sure. Um, okay. This is a poem that I think I may still be working on, even though it's several years old. Um, it's a poem that came from notes that I wrote while traveling. If you can travel as a writer, you should. And I mean, I've spent, I'm the crazy lady who spent three days riding the Los Angeles public bus up and down Wilshire Boulevard. Nobody does that. Everybody hates that. But I loved it, and I wrote that. You were the visiting writer on the... On the <laughs> yes, on the MTA bus, absolutely. But this was from, I went to do a fellowship in Lithuania, which is um, the place where some of my ancestors are from. So part of it was writing workshop, and part of it was sadly visiting kill sites, the Nazi kill sites, some of which contained still um, the bones of my family. So this was a really intense experience. And I brought it back. I brought the notes back um, from Lithuania and combined them with some things I was thinking about um, in the age of SB 1070, and I guess now, as I revise it, in the age of Donald Trump. So um, I'm really interested in how borders and shifting borders are actually sites of power and mm -hmm. empowerment. And the philosopher Gloria Anzaldúa obviously informs this as well. So this is called the Bodega of the Middle. Exactly what does it take to have grown from being a camera into being a gun? The gloss on the matter is tiny and extraneous, boiled potato filled with meat fried hot dog wrapped in bacon, the bodega of citrus, of the small black dog, of the aging burro, of the arm checkpoint, the unarmed, the Baroque detail of Zeta tagging on the interstate heading north to his church, or the crosses marking human roadkill at intervals. The bodega of the middle is currently between owners in escrow on layaway. Secessions in succession, duchy, proxy, Baja Alta, Baja Alta. It is drawn in chalk a meter from rain at the town hall, in unspeakable uniform sprawl, ringing burnt cities. Even as the ladies clutch bags and nod under kerchiefs, the arsonist is paid in a third currency. At the bodega of the middle, one is rarely required to show papers, to be any one thing at any one time. Boys are girls, and knives magically cling to walls at the ready. Surely there are bodies beneath one's feet, their owners moving objects a centimeter each night. Bodega of the Dibbuk, bodega of stars or stripes, of piles of hooves and hearts. The coyote, the partisan, dolor is inextricable from meaning. One draws from a bag a wedding ring with someone else's name engraved inside. Wave at the prisoners on work detail on the freeway past the mission. Hold still as the mad rabbi crosses the street toward the cafe, carrying eggs for midnight frying. Bodega of the middle, strands of amber without certificate, bread soda, piñata, fine linen, Orchata, boar's heart, cow's liver, Soviet cigarette, box of chiclets. Take what is given, what is given up. Gracias para todos. Achu. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we're almost out of time, but I do want to say, you know, in terms of revision, you know, it's always, you, you talked about bringing it back into the moment, and I wanted to thank you so much for bringing your, these voices into this moment. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you so much for joining us for Community of Poets. We'll see you next time.